Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Nothing But The Tooth, a podcast series by the Malaysian Dental Student Association, MDSA. I'm Elvin, a member of MDSA's Academic and Research Bureau for the 2023 and 2024 tenure. Today, we are a home specialist orthodontics clinic in Johor Bahru. Quick question, true or false, braces are the only form of orthodontics treatment available. We'll stay with us and we'll find out. Today, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Alex Hong, who will be sharing his insightful knowledge with us. Dr. Alex is the principal orthodontist here at Home Specialist Orthodontics Clinic, following in his father's footsteps. Back in 2014, Dr. Alex graduated with his bachelor's degree from University of Adelaide and proceeded to obtain multiple certifications from the Royal College of Surgeons in UK and Australia. He then proceeded to obtain his master's in orthodontics from University College London. With his help here today, we will be debunking common dental myths in regards to orthodontics and be discussing on retention after orthodontics treatment. So if you're ready, let us dive into it and we'll give you nothing but the tooth. A very good morning, Dr. Alex. We're really glad that you could join us for our first episode of Nothing But The Tooth today. Thank you so much for taking your time off for this. Could you tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I feel actually honoured, especially um, to be invited to your podcast, um, especially if this is the first podcast, yeah. if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So, um, yeah, happy to share my knowledge. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm Alex. I'm an orthodontist based in uh, Johor Bahru. Uh, I've been an orthodontist for about five years now. and I do most orthodontic cases from the interceptive orthodontics to hyperdontia to infected cases. But my so-called such such specialty or interest would be in orthodontic surgery. So I do a lot of those kind of cases. Um, yeah, happy to share my knowledge with you guys. So feel free to begin. Great. Let's start off with our first myth of the day. I'm sure everyone is waiting to hear some of your insights to some of these very interesting myths that we have here today. So in the world of dentistry as a whole, there is a very common misconception among patients that orthodontics is only done purely for cosmetic purposes. So Dr. Alex, what is your take on this? Yeah, it's understandable. I mean, nowadays in the 20, uh, 2024, you know, people are all into aesthetics, yeah. have a smile, have a Hollywood smile kind of mm. thing. So it's understandable that aesthetic is on the top of the list. But actually, um, there are a few other reasons. Um, so number one, uh, number two being uh, health reasons, mm. for example, uh, let's say dental health in mm. general. Um, when there's severe crowding, there's not enough space, very hard to keep clean, you may want to just straighten things up mm. to help to you know, brush properly so that patient can uh, improve their mm. gingival health, their caries. Uh, reduce carries risk, those kind of things. Just with good dental health, it means good general health mm. as well. So that's important. And the other thing is, uh, let's say for uh, function mm. reasons as well. So mm. uh, aesthetic, health and function, I think these are the three main circles. So with function, you know, people with severe class two or severe class three occlusions, they can't eat properly, they can bite, or people with you know, cross bites. Um, so once you sort those out for them, often you'll find that they are uh, they can eat, they can uh, uh, function more better because of occlusion. And generally, with all these three things, um, the psychosocial aspect would improve as well. They have self confidence, self esteem, those kind of things. So, with a good dental health, you know, generally leads to a good general health as well. Mm. So, Dr. Alex, another myth that we often hear is that getting braces will give you a lisp forever and this is definitely one of the more um, relatable myths because previously when i had braces on i couldn't articulate as well and because of that i was genuinely worried that even after taking my braces off i will continue to speak as such so could you enlighten us on this issue yeah, it's a bit scary to say mm. you get a list forever uh, some patients do query that like uh, sometimes they say oh, this is Mm. But generally, I, I mean, it's understandable as well because you're putting braces or whatever aligners, mm. you're putting it in a place where normally there wouldn't be something. Mm. So, mm. to the lips, to the mouth, tongue, and lips, where it's really sensitive, mm. often you'll feel the difference. And I would say, even if you do get some lips, usually it's just very temporary, okay. maybe the first few weeks. Just like wearing a new pair of shoes, initially mm. you'll feel a bit tight, a bit abrasive here and there, but just, you know, a, just hanging there for a little bit, usually you'll, you'll, you'll feel much better. <laughs> so the list would usually go away because the way your speech development is uh, is developed when you're young already. Mm. So if you're an adult, um, often you know it, it will it will get better over time. 
yeah because previously i couldn't pronounce words with s like yeah it was really difficult to so, articulate yeah, sometimes when you, when you add stuff on your teeth like tight planes or uh, you know um often you know they will interfere with your function your tongue and your lips so yeah it will it will affect a little bit but generally it's very short term and once like cases for over jet those kind of things once uh you find that the over jet is reduced often you find that uh, the speech actually gets feeling better there is a handful of people out there who believe and claim that they can straighten their teeth using DIY products such as floss, um, rubber bands or other sorts of homemade products. So from your point of view, could you tell us more about the efficiency and also the safety of such homemade approaches? Well, technically speaking, if you just put your hands onto a tooth and apply soft gentle pressure for hours, mm -hmm. your tooth can move. Okay. So this, these are the physiological mm -hmm. movements. So it's possible that like, you use rubber bands, you use floss. I'm actually not sure about that, but mm. like rubber bands, those kind of things, yes, you'll give a move. But it's very important to gain an understanding of uh, the mechanics of how you move teeth and understand the side effects. Mm. Those kind of things. Because if you just put teeth against each other, yes, they'll move, but often you'll find possibly with, without proper mechanics, mm. you'll find uncontrolled eating and with that you get, you know, uh, Root recession, mm. roots are deficient, mm. uh, you know, the tooth just spiraling out of control mm. or something. So, I mean, it, it's just something that you would have to be wary of. And as such, you know, I wouldn't do too much DIY stuff. It's always better to seek a professional for a trained professional for orthodontic treatment. Yeah, because nowadays, um, there's a lot of so called quacks out there, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, they, they claim that they can do uh, certain procedures for cheap. Yes, and, and it's really too cheap, it's really <laughs> too affordable for, mm. to, for them to say no. But um, I mean, they will learn on YouTube. It's, you can learn things on YouTube, but um, I, I would just be very careful. Uh, okay. Especially when you don't have proper understanding of the mechanics and how people. Okay. There is a belief that orthodontic treatments can only be done after all of the permanent teeth have erupted. So, Dr. Elias, could you explain to us what interceptive orthodontics is and perhaps some of the appliances and how they work? Yeah. So, interceptive orthodontics, it's a whole chapter by itself. Mm. Sometimes the patient will ask me, what kind of, what kind of uh, treatment can you do for this mm. stage? They will just think, you know, that what, the, what kind of problem can you do at maybe at an eight year old, they would just think that it's probably a few items, but actually it's a whole essay questions. Yeah. Uh, essay question. So for interceptive orthodontics, it's basically the idea is to, um, if there is a problem, we want to intercept it, step in, simplify the solution, mm -hmm. solve that issue first, mm -hmm. get in and then get out. Mm -hmm. And then you let the patient develop into the, the full mix edition. Mm -hmm. And then we deal with it with a comprehensive treatment later on. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, at that point in time, uh, the treatment will be easier, shorter, shorter time, less difficulty, less complications mm -hmm. as well. Okay? Mm -hmm. So with interceptive, the more common, uh, we usually um, advise patients to come in for at least their first orthodontic assessment at about seven or eight years old. Okay. Usually just with an OPG, uh, you can see would there be potential problems mm -hmm. or everything will be nice and smooth. Um, and the, Often what we look for are, you know, potentially infected teeth, infected, the common ones are incisors, canines, uh, or first molar, mm -hmm, six, mm -hmm, upper mm -hmm, sixes mm -hmm. especially. Uh, so these are the infections. Mm -hmm. We look for supernumerary teeth, if there, there's any medial dent that may block uh, teeth from coming through mm -hmm. or growing properly. Uh, you have all sorts of things like mm -hmm. hypodontia, uh, death, mm -hmm. uh, all these kind of things as well. So uh, uh, even class two or class three, mm -hmm. um, and it's always better to capture them earlier mm, and okay. then say if there's no issues, okay, I'll see you in one year's time, two years' time. For example, with uh, functional appliances mm. in class 2 treatment, you want to do it just before the, their puberty. Mm. So females about 11, boys about 12, 13, that kind of mm, thing. Mm. Yeah, so it's always nice to capture them earlier before rather than uh, capturing them later mm. and not being able to do stuff. Because I've also heard some people saying that um, you should only get bases done when you're after 12. Yeah, so that's a very big misconception. Mm, mm, mm. When you come in at 12, yes, all the teeth are true, mm. but 
I mean, if you have a uh, you know se severely infected or ectopic incisor, then I mean most cases can still be done. Mm -hmm. But anything related to growth modification, mm -hmm. so like class three, mm -hmm. class three, for example, the best time to do face masks is uh somewhere between eight to ten. Okay, for example. So you're mm -hmm. going to put them put the upper jaw forwards eight to ten. If you miss the boat, then you know it gets a bit more tricky. Yeah. And uh, for our last myth of the day, there are a handful of people out there who think that retainers after an orthodontic treatment are optional or even temporary. So can you shed some light on this? Mm, yeah, some people, you know, after they mm. finish their braces, wear the retainers and then they completely stop wearing. Yeah. And a few years later, they come back. After my, my teeth has moved, uh, I did second round, third round, fourth round. Maybe. Okay, okay. So um, in the past, mm. uh, in the 80s or so, generally they... They do braces, they just get them to wear one mm, pair of retainers. Mm, that's all. Mm. Uh, and then we find that you still move. Mm. Then in the 90s or 2000s, then they say, you know, wear two, three years mm, enough. Mm. Just prolong it a little mm, bit. Mm. Huh? And then you still move. Okay. <laughs> so my generation now, mm. or the people trained now, mm. uh, before the concept of uh, retention for life. Okay. So basically, I tell my patients if you want straight teeth, Wear it for as long as you want, straight teeth. Okay. Yeah, so basically, it's a lifelong retention. Mm. Dr. Alex, I noticed that you stressed on the importance of wearing the retainers after an orthodontic treatment. And this topic so happens to fall under our curricular portion of today, which is a retention after orthodontic treatment. And uh, I'm sure that you have come across a lot of cases in your clinical practice that uh, many patients are facing relapsed teeth. So, from a physiological standpoint, what are the factors that lead to the teeth being relapsed? Okay, so the, the, the why, okay, when we move teeth, mm. right, when we move teeth, mm. we move them in a new position. Mm. Uh, there are gingival fibers or periodontal fibers attached to all these teeth mm. with each other, with the bone, all this PDL stuff. So, uh, when you move them, you stretch them. And then, often, if you just let go, they will just recoil and point, it points back, okay. and the teeth will move back to the original position. So what we want to do is actually to hold it in place mm. with retainers such that the, all these genome fibers can reattach themselves mm. and reorganize themselves uh, so that they will stay firm. Okay? So like certain fibers, are, I think the uh, uh, collagenous fibers, mm. they often need about six months to mm. readapt, mm. whereas the supercrestal genome fiber, fibers and elastic fibers, they get about 12 months. Mm -hmm. So which is, I mean, Traditionally, you know, they wear one, two years mm -hmm. just for this to uh, hold it in place. Mm -hmm. But then they still find that it may take longer, okay. you know, so that's why we say life, lifetime. And so number one, the, you know, the normal physiological response is that the elastic toys would want to adapt, uh, bounce back, and so you have to hold them in place. Other reasons why people will relapse is if you move them out of mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. out of unstable position, mm -hmm. like, let's say you procline your sizes too mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. Then your lip will be there to sort of resist and push it back okay. eventually push back. or if you put your teeth in unstable positions mm. often the the bite is not stable so mm. they, they have to move more easily mm. those kind of places. i see dr alex and we are often confused on when we should wear our retainers and how long we should wear them for because um if you look at everyone everyone seems to be having their own different schedule for wearing retainers or their own um, yeah. retainer regime if you so call it so can you clear this up for us okay it's very hard because different people have different protocols mm, okay depends on how they are trained mm -hmm. depends on their preference mm. as well and also depends on patients uh, compliance mm -hmm. so personally for me what i say is i will do uh, six months of full-time wear okay of aligners morning afternoon mm -hmm. and night mm -hmm. remove only when eating and sleeping mm -hmm. and then six months later when i do the review i track Everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's reduce now to night time. I see. Okay. So just wear it uh, 12 hours, you know, after dinner, just wear it until the following morning. Mm -hmm. And then six months later, you can reduce some of to uh, alternate night. So mm -hmm. you want to go Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, or you want to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sundays, up to you. Mm -hmm. And then in the long term, after that, I'll say just wear about two nights a week. So uh, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, for example, mm -hmm. and just do that long term. There are some people who, you know, to say wear at night. Mm, 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 there are some research um, mm, comparisons. Mm, mm. Uh, I think there was one that said that said that wearing it full time mm -hmm. and then converting to night time mm -hmm. is actually the same as just wearing it night time from the get go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is compared over six months or twelve months. Okay. I can't remember specifically. But yeah, I 
actually uh you know you don't really need to worry that much mm. I, I think minimum every night is okay at least for the first year uh, but just a little bit more guessing you know? okay yeah yeah, yeah I, get it. Like, I like to pay for it now. Mm. What different types of retainers are out there and how do they differ in terms of effectiveness and also uh, patient compliance? Okay, so I like to separate them into two categories. Mm -hmm. Not one being the fixed retainers and one being the, the removable retainers. So starting with the removable one, there are two. One is the plastic, the, we call it the S6 retainer, mm -hmm. that's the brand name, but mm -hmm. essentially it's a clear retainer. Mm -hmm. or, and the other one is the Holly retainer, mm -hmm. which is made of acrylic and mm. metal. Mm. So with the vacuum form retainer, mm -hmm. or the plastic, clear plastic retainer, um, I guess the best the, 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 the benefits about it is that it's clear mm -hmm. and it's very easy to make and more affordable okay. for the patient. So it's mm. cheaper, the lab cost is lower. Mm. Uh, and it's aesthetic. When you wear it full time initially, you know you want to go out without having something in your teeth. So patients like that better. More aesthetic. Mm. Mm. However the downside of it is that um, uh, they break a little bit more easily. Generally, they do have a lifespan of about, say, two to five years. Mm. Uh, depends on how much you grind your teeth, how much you, how how rough you remove your retainer. So there are, there are ways to prolong it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So number one is long uh, durability of it. Mm. Number two is uh, uh, sometimes if you have high carries risk, mm. it may not be the best thing because mm. your saliva when, when you cover it over your teeth, your saliva cannot go in and do the cleansing okay. yeah. kind of thing. So it can be a little bit difficult. Huh? And then lastly, uh, certain movements, for example, if you expanded your arch, mm -hmm. your maxilla, uh, and then if you use a plastic retainer, it seems to not hold expansion that well, your teeth will want to move back. Okay. So these kind of things, usually it's better to use the poly retainer, okay. the acrylic one, okay. which leads me into the, this poly mm. retainer. So it's made of acrylic and metal that wraps around your teeth. Uh, the good thing is that you know it's very durable mm. it lasts robust you know it lasts for easily more than five years mm -hmm. uh you, your saliva can go mm -hmm. into the cleansing uh and it holds all these transfers certain move and it's very versatile you can add modifications you can add wires you can add certain things to help to move things mm -hmm. if you want to and then you can cut it out later on but the delta of it is that it's more expensive okay uh, it is more difficult to make so you know it takes longer time to make it um, yeah, that's actually the, 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 the downside of that. And lastly, we have the bonded retainer as well. Okay. Bonded retainers, um, I use them mainly for certain features uh, okay. that the patient had pre treatment. So, if usually I use it for teeth that are more highly likely to relapse. Mm. So, for okay. example, uh, rotations, mm. teeth with rotation, teeth with uh, diastema, mm. with gaps mm. initially, mm. or teeth where you move it completely out of position when you expand too much or when you uh, when you profile a little bit more, uh, then you want to hold it. You want the additional insurance, mm -hmm. or additional effort to sort of retain it. Okay, so it's a fixed one. You put it behind your teeth, two to two or three to three, and usually I always add on the clear plastic retainer on top. So like double double mm -hmm. retainer just to hold it in place. So, but the bonded retainers. So benefits is that mm -hmm. you know it helps to retain those small high risk of relapse mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. better. Uh, but the downside is that you know hygiene can be an issue. Okay. Hygiene, you know, especially lower incisors where your okay. oil is deficit. Yeah, okay. it's always difficult to keep clean. Um, so you do need regular clean. And number two is um, you may need some maintenance with it. So for okay. example, it may come loose, it may fracture, especially if you're eating hard objects like apple, mm. fried chicken, skin, that kind of thing. So when they break, then I have a bit troublesome. You know, you have to come back in, glue it back, or either do a new one. Mm. Um, and it does take some skills to bend the wires. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's not the easiest. It's a bit troublesome, but it does, does the job of keeping it. Thanks for clearing that up because I just wanted to ask you, why not we just prescribe, you know, the fixed retainers for everyone? Then we wouldn't have to worry about them, uh, you know, not wearing the retainers after yeah. the orthodontic treatment. Yeah, that, that, I mean, yeah, for that mm. exact reason, so mm. uh, hygiene issues mm, and mm, the, uh, yeah. uh, maintenance issues. But the thing is, this one you're only you're only retaining the front teeth, right? Mm. <laughs> Let's say if you do extractions, posteriorly, okay. five, mm. four, you it's very hard to put the wire all the way see. to the back. Okay. I think your wire actually can loose. Um, so this one is more effective in maintaining the front okay. front portion of the okay. back portion. You, you always still need the retainer, which is why I always do like double. Okay. If I, if the other okay. 
Lastly, there is also an occurrence known as late lower incisor crowding. So, Dr. Alex, could you explain to us what exactly is this um, late lower incisor crowding and what are the steps that can be taken to prevent it from happening? Yeah, I mean, with that, you know, some, some patients, they will say, or some friends, you know, they will say, oh, when I was younger, my teeth were all straight. Then as they age, my 30s, 40s, they say, how come my lower teeth start yeah. to get worse and worse? So, um, this is where you, you know, late incisor crowding, um, that's uh, it's an essay question, uh, basically. Okay. Uh, there are quite a few factors that can happen. Uh, number one being, and, and this is this happens because of uh, the mandibular growth, or, or like you know, as we grow, uh, as we mature, there are a lot of changes that happen within the body. So, number one, uh, there's something about the mandible that it mm. actually grows forwards and upwards, okay. or it may grow forwards, uh, backwards and downwards. Okay? Okay. So 80% will, will grow forwards and upwards. Okay? Okay. And the, when they do that, actually what happens is that because the lower incisors are stuck mm. behind the upper incisors, mm. uh, when they grow forwards, the incisors are actually trapped behind the upper incisors. Okay? Mm. So and as they, the whole jaw move forwards, the upper lower incisors kind of just retrocline and get pushed backwards. And they are all pushed with, into a space of the area of lesser space, mm -hmm. so they become you know, okay, yeah, yeah. further. Huh? And vice versa, like uh, if they it was a backward rotation, mm -hmm. so the jaw would open up like this. Okay. And then when they open up like this, the lower lip is acting in place, mm -hmm. and the lower lip is the one that pushes the lower teeth backwards. I see, state. okay. So mm -hmm. they are all constantly pushed inwards, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you know they, they got up. And then number two is uh, there's something called the mesial drift theory. Like for example, if you see let's say uh, five facing, okay. often you'll find the six just tipping forward. Yeah. It doesn't tip distally when yeah, it's yeah. mesial. Uh, it will drift mesial as well, or even rotate mesial. So I think it's something about the fibers, the transverse mm -hmm. fibers that they generally pull your teeth forwards. And as they mature, they pull your teeth forwards. And then when everything gets pulled forwards, they all crowd up in front. So you the see, lower okay. incisors is the one that that uh, um, that resists the, uh, the damage. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, I think there's some changes in diet as well. Traditionally, okay. like with evolution, mm. our ancestors, uh, ancestors they, they eat a lot mm. harder diet. Mm. So they mm. eat like meat, all this kind of thing. They, they grind a lot. Mm. Okay? And with that, they do this, they create interproximal wear. Okay. Interproximal between the teeth, there's a lot of wear. Mm -hmm. And that indirectly creates available space for your teeth to align. I see, okay. okay? Uh, whereas now, our diets are getting softer, mm. finer. So we don't we don't eat like them anymore. Okay. So our teeth don't wear it as much, and as that they are occupying other spaces, and again crowding crowding them up. Mm. And then lastly, you know our teeth are. I mean, there's a lot more, but I, I just touched on this last mm. one. Uh, our soft tissues, mm -hmm. okay, our our teeth are in a neutral position, mm -hmm. a neutral zone of equilibrium. Yeah. So it's a it's a space between the lips and the tongue. Okay. And they rest there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, over age. Uh, the age, the muscular tone of the lip increases, so you get kind of like uh, stronger muscles. Okay. And then that would, if the lip has a stronger muscle, it will push inwards. Mm -hmm. okay. So your teeth generally will move inwards mm -hmm. again into the area of less spaces. So, so again, with all this crowding. So uh, a few more reasons as well, but these are the main uh, key reasons why your low incisors could, could crowd up. Mm -hmm. That is all the questions we have today for you, Dr. Alex. I'm sure all of the viewers and listeners, and myself included, have learned a lot from all of the insightful knowledge that you have provided. Thank you so much for taking your time off for this. Okay, no problem. Um, I'm very happy to share my knowledge here. Um, happy to you know, um, share it with whoever wants to listen. So I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Very happy to have done this with you. No worries. That's it for today, everyone. This wraps up our first episode of MDSA's podcast, Nothing But The Tooth. Stay tuned and we'll catch you in the next episode.